are uh, involved in children's church in any way, shape, or form, you can be dismissed at this time. You know, Jesus said in John's gospel, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that he who the Son has made free is free indeed. I mean, think about that sentence for just a second. He who the Son has made free is free indeed. If that is the case, if that is in essence what salvation is, it is to free us from our sins, it's to free us from the debt that we owe to God because of our sinfulness, it's to free us from the penalty that we owe because of our sin. If liberty is the reason that God saved us, and it is, as we see in Scripture over and over and over again, let me ask you a question. Why are we as believers so bound and determined then to trade old shackles, oftentimes, for new shackles. Why would we do that? Why would we voluntarily take on things that are not in Scripture, that may have, been mean, may have the best intentions? Why would we then turn around and intentionally shackle ourselves back up when Jesus was trying to tell us that when he has made us free, he made us free indeed? Now, does that mean free to sin? Well, Paul addresses that in Romans. You know, should I continue to sin so that grace may abound? God forbid that I should do that. But why is it that we have a tendency to do that? And why is it, does that then lead us to often a lot of believers, way more than I ever wished I could have possibly imagined in my lifetime, that I have met over the years, actually view grace, the single greatest gift God has ever blessed humanity with. Grace, by grace that we are saved. It's also by grace that we are supposed to live once we are saved, once we come to faith in Christ, that I have actually met a lot of people, <laughs> way, like I said, way more than I care to even admit, a lot of people who actually view grace as, as controversial. That's the C in grace. It's controversial. It's, it's, it's something to be a little wary of. Not when it comes to salvation. Or they're very quick to say, are you saved by grace? Now live by this, something other than grace. It's really amazing, isn't it? Let me tell you a story before we get into the message here that happened some years back. In fact, I can probably remember, it's probably 1995 if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. So it goes back a few years. I had just graduated from seminary. I was in the upstate of South Carolina. I was sitting in the driveway with a guy who was a pastor, a friend of mine, really more of an acquaintance. We really didn't know each other all that well. We were doing some things together. But anyway, I was with him and he was driving me home. Uh, back to my house, and then, of course, it was South Carolina in the summertime, which is a lot like Florida in the summertime when these storms come blowing up out of nowhere. So we pull into the driveway, and this torrential rainstorm just blows through. So instead of me getting out and rushing into the house and getting all soaked and wet, we sat there and waited for a minute because we figured it was going to pass after a few minutes, which it did. But it was the conversation that took place inside of that car that I have never forgotten. 1995, and I've never forgotten that conversation. We were sitting there talking about a lot of different things. Obviously, we're two seminary graduates, we're two theologians, all this, whatever terminology you want to use. So we're talking about different things related to that. And he made the comment about a particular religious group, doesn't matter who it was. And he was lamenting the fact that one of the biggest mistakes they were making was that so much of their doctrine was based on tradition and not scripture. And he, he was just lambasting this particular group and really making kind of a big deal about that. And I acknowledge that. Yeah, that is a problem. It is a problem, obviously, when we develop our doctrine on anything other than God's Word. And then I followed up by saying, yeah, it's a shame we do this too. Now, when I say we, at the particular moment we were talking, I had graduated from a Southern Baptist seminary. I had been ordained in the Southern Baptist denomination. And he was a Southern Baptist pastor. So when I said we, I was, I was more referring to the evangelical churches in general, but specifically our particular denomination. I said, yes, too bad we do the same thing. And he was just taken aback, like, no, we're people of the word. We don't, we don't do that. We don't put these extraneous, tradition-laden burdens on people. We just do whatever the word says. And I said, oh, okay. All right, well, let me ask you a question. I was not trying to be confrontational. I was, it was a very calm conversation. I just wanted to ask a few questions and see what his answer was. I said, okay, you're the pastor of church. Tell me how somebody becomes a member of your church. I'm just curious. How, if I came in tomorrow 
and I came up, I came down front, and I said I wanted to be a member of your church, what would happen after that? He said, well, we would talk to you to make, first we'd talk to you to make sure that you're a believer, as best as you possibly can, obviously. We would try to see if, you've, you know, if you've, there's a moment in life that you, that you came to faith. Okay, sure, yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. And we have this little class we go through. It gives you a chance to op- ask questions about the church, about doc. Great, yeah, sure, I'm on, I'm on top of that. That sounds really good. We, we would ask you to come down during the service, at the end of the service, and we will present you from there. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all good for that. And if you haven't been baptized, you're going to need to be baptized. Okay, sure, I got that. I see that. And if you have been baptized before, then we'll have to, we'll have to talk about that a little bit. And I said, okay, so, so let me give you a hypothetical situation. Let's say that someone in your congregation has been baptized, but it wasn't by immersion, but it was a believer's baptism. It, was, it happened after they were saved. It wasn't infant baptism. We're not counting that. Let's take that completely off the table. I said, what happens? By the way, this happens on a fairly regular basis with people who change denominations who go from one church to the other. If somebody came to you and said, I'm a believer and I was baptized, but it wasn't immersion, would you let them join your church? No, they'd have to be rebaptized. Okay. All right. Well, let me, let me ask you this. When you're teaching scripture about baptism and you're talking about it from a theological standpoint and you're talking to your congregation do you teach them that that you have to be baptized in order to be saved in order to be able to get to heaven oh well, no no because the scripture doesn't teach that yes you're right the scripture does not teach that you have to be baptized in order to get to heaven now don't get me wrong I would have a serious problem with someone who really claimed to be a believer and said they did not want to be baptized. And I have never come across someone like that in my all the years I've dealt with. I've never met anybody. They may be a little wary if they're afraid of water about being immersed or or something, but I've never met anybody who just said, I'm a believer, I forget this baptism stuff. I've never met anybody who's, who's done that. I said, let me ask you another question. Let's say you had somebody in your congregation who was not a member of your congregation, did not want to be a member of your congregation, got saved during the service, and said they wanted you to baptize them. Baptize them. Would you baptize them if they were not going to become a member of your church? Oh, no, 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 we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We'd tell them to go find a church and be baptized there. I said, okay, so let me see if, if we got all this information floating around out here. So let's try to really narrow this down. What you're saying is that you teach your congregation that you don't have to be baptized to get into heaven, but you do have to be baptized to get into your church. Is that in essence what what we're saying? And you know you got them when there's nothing but silence after that. I said, you see the problem with this? We're linking baptism with church membership. Find me one passage that you can even proof text to make it seem like in order to be able to join a church, you have to be baptized in that church, and then that's the rule and regulation in order for you to become a member of that church. I challenge you further. Find me a passage that even talks about bapti- uh, church membership in the first place, specifically mentioned in Scripture. You can find some passages that maybe go there, but linking baptism with church membership is not Biblical. I'm not saying it's anti-biblical. You know there's a difference between being non-biblical and anti-biblical. I said it's just non-biblical. The Bible doesn't talk about that in any way, shape, or form. So you're saying you can't get into you can get into heaven without being baptized, but you can't get into my church. Right? Is that in essence what you're what you're saying? I said, you see the problem with that, right? And he said, Yes, I do see the problem with that. I said, you see. That, that's a burden that you're placing, an extra biblical burden you are placing on someone in the context of living out their Christian life in grace. You, you see that, right? Yes, I do see that. And he sat there for a while and he thought about it and then he finished up by saying this, and I've never forgotten this. He said, you know, you're right. There's nothing biblical about this in any way, shape, or form. It is putting an extra step in there, but you know what? I'm not going to change it. <laughs> but isn't that interesting? Why would a pastor... A learned person of Scripture, look at something like that. Know that they were biblically wrong. That when they were standing up there and telling their congregation that they did not have the force of Scripture behind it, because I have a really simple rule whenever I communicate the gospel or any part of the Scripture to people. I don't say, thus saith the Lord, if the Lord didn't, thus saith it. Right? I'm not going to... 
I will tell you where the Bible is very clear and specific on something, and I will tell you where it's not very clear and specific on something. The problem is, as human beings, we don't like non-clear, unspecific things. And so we have a tendency to fill them in with a whole bunch of rules that have nothing to do with Scripture in any way, shape, or form. Again, let me clarify. I'm not saying it's anti-Christian or anti-biblical. That's not my point. But it is non-biblical. But when it's spoken from up here, it has the force of Scripture behind it. When he says, you've got to be baptized, you've got to be immersed, baptized. Oh, by the way, please, don't misunderstand what I, <laughs> what I said. Remember I told you grace is controversial? Okay. <laughs> I, anytime we talk about this, it kind of people kind of get the wrong idea. This is not a sermon. I am not saying anything about immersion baptism as opposed to any other kind of baptism. That's not what this is about. It has nothing to do with immersion or non-immersion. It's the idea of do we as believers really trust that God wants us to live in grace, or do we not trust his word and say, I got to fill in the blanks and add a bunch of rules in here that have nothing to do with what God said in any way, shape, or form, but it just makes it a little clearer. That's shackling people. Jesus suffered on a cross to set me free, to give me liberty. Not free to sin, exact, it's the exact opposite, the freedom to not sin anymore. He not only saved me by grace, he now wants me to live in that very same grace. But every single time I place a well-meaning, well-intentioned rule that says, if you're a believer, you have to, or if you're really a Christian, you will do this, or you will not do this, and it is not connected to Scripture in any way, shape, or form, all I am doing to you is shackling you. I have one set of chains was taken off, I'm trying to put another set of chains on you. Now, I may think those chains look like gold, but they're still chains. What is it that drives us to do that? Why is it that we're so readily able to talk about being saved by grace, but get so terrified when we're actually talking about living by grace? That's what we're going to talk about here this morning, because that's the reality of where we are. Legalism has always been, from the very first century until today, has always been a gigantic problem in the church and i define legalism as any rule that is placed from one believer onto another that says that you're supposed to do this but has no basis and no real actual basis in scripture we've got a whole list of them we can go through we're not gonna well i'll mention a few here and there give you a few examples but what i want to do more than anything today is to look at from the standpoint and think we should not view grace (laughs) it's like it's only (laughs) It's almost like people are afraid the more you know about grace, the more likely you are to sin. Isn't that not the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your life? The more I know about grace, the less likely I am to sin. The more free I know that I am in him, the more likely I am to do what he wants me to do and to not do the things he doesn't want me to do. And that's what all of this is about. He who the Son has made free is free indeed. Are we living that freedom and why is this always so controversial. We've got a lot of things that we're going to look at here. We have a lot of different passages. We have a basic passage, uh, probably a series, uh, probably a, a chapter and, and verses here that we're going to start out at that I bet you nobody in this room has been in a church that has heard a sermon preached from these verses. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying it's extremely rare. I've been a believer now for a very long time. I've been churches all over the world. I've never heard anybody preach from these passages and we're going to be in first uh, we're, the first one we're going to look at is going to be in uh first corinthians uh let me double check make sure i'm giving you the right ones first corinthians chapter eight verses one through eight now that's going to be our our basic passage that's going to be our foundational passage but we are going to of course uh zip around quite a little bit uh as we uh, as we continue to go through this so we're going to look at three reasons why grace is so controversial but before we do that we are going to read the passage our focal passage here, and you'll see exactly where we're, where we're coming from from this, because this is a very, to a lot of people, a very controversial set of verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Now, concerning food offered to idols, if you have to remember, Paul is writing to the Corinthians who were pagans, who had come to faith in Christ. They still had to buy food. When they went to the market to buy food, the food they were buying were for animals, because they lived in a pagan culture. The food they were buying were animals that were part of the sacrifice to a pagan god. Right? So that would be like us going to Winn-Dixie and going straight to the pagan section. And they say, okay, this, this, all this meat over here was, was, was uh, sacrificed to a god, and uh, this was the leftover, so now we're going to sell it in the marketplace. 
except they didn't have the luxury of sections. Every, every person they bought food from, meat from, was going to, that was going to be the case. And so as now as new believers, they're thinking, oh my goodness, can I eat this meat? Can I buy it? I'm actually paying these people who are doing these things, and then I'm eating this meat. Is it lawful? Is it okay for me as a Christian? Now that I know the difference between the two, is it lawful? Is it okay for me to eat meat sacrificed by, to buy this meat and eat meat, eat meat sacrificed by idols? And this is the answer that Paul gave. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol is no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. And if you know the rest of that, that chapter, he goes on to say, but be careful not to make your brother stumble and all the other things that go along with that. Now, you might say, great, I now know the answer to the question, should I go and eat meat sacrificed to idols? That's really going to make a lot of headway for me here in the good old 21st century in the United States where we probably are not going to be eating meat sacrificed to idols would be my guess. So obviously, if we hold it to that, it's strict interpretation, then that passage means absolutely what to us? Nothing. It means nothing to us if all we're looking at it is that it's talking about idle meat. If we look at it, though, in the way that it's intended, the idle meat can then be substituted for anything that's not directly covered by Scripture. It is that matter of grace that we apply to these decisions. Let me ask you something. Are there some things in the Scripture that are crystal clear, do not do this. Yes. Are there other parts in Scripture that are crystal clear that says, do, do this. Thou shalt and thou shalt not are in the Scripture. There are things that God has told us as believers, all of us, none of us, if you're here today, you've come to faith in Christ, none of us should do. Or that in the other way, that we all should do if we are really, truly a believer. Does he mention, does the scripture mention everything that happens to our life and puts it into those categories? The short answer to that question is no, it does not. Obviously, that's never going to be able to happen. So God wants to give us some understanding about it. So, for example, if we're talking about something being, being a matter of conscience between believers, I can't say it's a matter of conscience for me uh, that I shouldn't commit adultery, but I can't tell you to go out and commit adultery. Right? We can't do that. That's one of the, the thou shalt nots. Right? But what about the things that are not specifically, strictly covered in the Scripture? What are we supposed to do with those? That's the thing we need to focus on here this morning. Let's pray before we continue on. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. Lord, you have not only saved us by your grace, we now live and walk and serve and act in your grace. Your own law was given not to make people righteous because that could never happen, but to show us that we fall short of the standard that you give, to show us that we, to magnify our sin, Lord. So if that was, if, if your own law, which was good, it came from you, there was nothing wrong with the law, it was from you, it's a good thing. But if we understand that even those laws and those rules could not perfect us, could not make us better. How in the world could we think that any other rule that we could come up with after we're saved, not related to your word, could make us better or to make us closer to you? Lord, I just want, I want your grace to be seen for what it truly is. For what it truly means for us to be able to live our lives on this planet until the day you call us home. To be able to live in grace that can only come from you and that can only come from your word for it's in the precious name of jesus i pray amen so let's look up front here at the three reasons why at least three reasons why grace is often considered controversial 
Reason number one, grace is often considered controversial because it requires us to free people when it is in, not in our nature as human beings to free people. That is, in essence, one of the things that makes it so difficult for us. You know, I've told you many, many times before, um, one of the biggest mistakes that we can make uh, in reading God's Word, especially when we're reading those, those moments where a great miracle takes place, that sometimes we get tunnel vision when we're reading that particular passage. And we're so focused on the miracle that we forget to look at some of the teachings surrounding the miracle. So I would say, go to one of your favorite miracle stories in all the Scripture. Read the part about the miracle, but read what comes before it and read what comes after it and see if you see anything that maybe you haven't seen before. And probably one of the greatest miracles that God ever did, one of only, uh, what, a few times, three times, I think, that he actually raised somebody from the dead, is the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. And everybody knows the story of Lazarus. Everybody probably knows his sister's name. Mary and Martha. Everybody probably knows how long he was dead. He was in the ground four days. Everybody knows some of the amazing things that Jesus said. That chapter is one of the most incredible chapters in all of Scripture. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. How cool is that, right? One of the coolest things Jesus ever said. That was in that. And then, of course, the greatest words that he spoke during that entire time period. Three words, Lazarus, come forth. And we see that a guy who was in the tomb for four days gets up and walks out of the tomb. And man, when that happens, our brain, when we're reading the scripture, I will tell you this, our brain will cut off after that passage. When we read that, that is, but that is not the end of the story. There is so much, there are two verses out there we're going to read, read, read here in John chapter 11 that are extremely important to understanding what we're trying to say here this morning. And that goes back to verses 43 and 44, just after, well, we'll read 43 and 44. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out, or in this version, come out, and, and obviously the King James, come forth. And I'm telling you, nine times out of ten when we're reading this, our brain will cut off when we read that passage. We might read the next one, but we'll, we're so enraptured by what just happened that we're going to miss something extremely important here in verse 44. The man who died came out with his hands and feet bound in linen strips. Think of a mummy. That's the way he was wrapped up. So Lazarus comes out. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how well, you kind of, I guess you kind of waddle out. So he's got all these wraps around him, right? So he comes out. He's got all these things wrapped around him. Then Jesus says something that is absolutely extraordinary here, but most of us never catch it and never see it. It says... Um, Go back to the beginning of verse 44. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Take those grave clothes off of him. Jesus just raised a man from the dead. He was God incarnate. A few bandages were not his issue. He could have very easily had Lazarus walk out and then had the bandages fall off of him. I guess he even could have, if he really wanted to be really dramatic, he could have done like this incredible halt thing. And he could have had Lazarus go, you know, just, yeah, I'm busting out. I mean, there are any number of ways he could have removed those linen cloths, right? He's God in the flesh. Of course he could do that. He just raised a guy from the dead. But he didn't. He told the people standing around him, you, you, release him. Let me ask you something. Why didn't he tell Lazarus to release himself? It's a really simple answer to the question. He couldn't. <laughs> he was wrapped up. How was Lazarus going to unwrap himself? So Jesus chose not to do it, even though he could have. He didn't tell Lazarus to do it because Lazarus couldn't do it because he was bound in the first place, he tells the people around him. And you're thinking, okay, what, what, what are we talking about here? Look, if all of this story is about Lazarus, the one guy Lazarus being raised from the dead, it really doesn't have much to do with us, right? Except we rejoice for Lazarus. That's yeah, pretty cool for him. What does this mean for me? But if we look at what Lazarus's story 
really implies for those of us 2,000 years after the fact, you do realize that that is an exact microcosm of what happens to us when we come to faith in Christ, right? What does the scripture say is our, is our natural state before we come to faith in Christ? We are dead in our trespasses and sins, and then we're brought to life. That's actually what immersion baptism is a picture of, right? You're down, you're dead, you're raised back up, newness of life. So we see this picture over and over again of coming from death to life. It's the same thing with Lazarus. Lazarus came from death to life. When we come from death to life, are we ha do we have grave clothes on? We do, don't we? Old thoughts, old ideas, old worldviews, the way the world looked to us, right? We have all those things. Now, why don't we just do it ourselves? Because we can't, because we're still bound by those old grave clothes. You see the point we're trying to, that I'm trying to make here? As believers, when somebody comes to faith, you know what our job is? It's to free them, not wrap them back up. Notice Jesus said, unbind him. He didn't then say, go get some clean cloths and wrap him right back up. It is not in our nature as human beings to free and unbind people. If that's the case then, why does every single thing that happens in this country, the, 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 the standard response is, you've got to create a law. You've got to create a law for that. We got this ethnic unrest over there. We'll just create a law. Well, yeah, because that'll take care of it. Well, we have a murder problem here. Well, let's create a law. Yeah, because that'll take care of that too, right? Nobody ever kills anybody because there's a law against that. We are, our driving desire is not to free people. It's to limit people. And what Jesus is trying to tell us is, you have to understand, this is what grace is all about. No matter how well-meaning they are, if someone then tries to come up to you and wrap you up with a, 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 a wrapping that is not scriptural, they're just trying to bind you. It has nothing to do with grace in any way, shape, or form. That being the case, let me ask you this. Is it possible for something that's not covered specifically in scripture, is it possible for me to come to a conclusion that it's wrong for me, but it might not be wrong for you? Yes. It is possible for that. I, look, I'll give you a perfect example. We'll use some examples. I'm not a drinker. I don't drink alcohol. Every once in a blue moon, I'll take a swallow of a glass of wine, but not even a, really a full glass. I do not drink. That is no problem. What would be the problem then is if I said, the scripture now says that all of you shouldn't drink either. It's interesting. I got, an, I got a contact in, on the website from somebody who was asking about the church. And of all the things they could have possibly asked me about, that was the one they asked me about. Isn't that interesting? I don't drink. I'm wondering how you feel about people who drink, Christians who drink, because I don't believe Christians should drink. Okay, well, I, little, there's a little bit of a problem with that. Scripture doesn't say that. In fact, Scripture encourages you to take a drink of wine for your stomach's sake, so it doesn't. Now, it clearly says what? Don't be intoxicated. That's exactly right. Don't drink to the point of intoxication. But it doesn't say that. So, yes... I can be, I not only can be, I have been with believers on a regular basis. They drink, I don't. It's okay for them, it's not okay for me. And guess what? We're both right. That's what's so incredible about grace. If there was anybody on the planet, by the way, that wishes they could stand up and tell you that all drinking of alcohol is bad, I would be hard-pressed to find someone other than me. Alcohol basically destroyed my family. Father was an alcoholic, grew up under those circumstances. He died when he was 46 years old. 46. My dad drank himself to death for 46 years. If there was anybody that wishes I could stand up here and tell you that the scripture says, thou shalt not drink, it would be me. But I can't do that. Why? Because I would be shackling you. It's for me. It's, it's not what I'm supposed to do. But not, but not for you. Because it's not in our nature. Our nature now, our new nature, our grace-filled nature is supposed to free and liberate other believers, not shackle them. Tell them about the things in the scripture that says you're not supposed to do and you are supposed to do? Yes, but don't go beyond that. You go beyond that and in essence what we're saying is God's word's not enough. He didn't do a good enough job and he needs me to finish it off. How many things out there could we possibly find that fall into this category? Uh, Halloween. Well, that's a big one, right? Should Christians celebrate Halloween? The answer is yes and no. It depends on how God is leading you. Drinking, movies, you know, it, it was funny. I used to listen to this guy 
and see him from time to time. He was a pastor of a big church. He was on TV and all this other stuff. And he had a hard and fast rule, and he had no problem standing up here from the pulpit. And he would point his fingers out there, and he would say, if you're a believer, you will not go see an R-rated movie. You will not go see an R-rated movie. No Christian could. Of course, the Scripture doesn't say that. No, script, no Christian should go see an R-rated movie. You're sinning if you go see an R-rated movie. You're not really a believer if you go to see an R-rated movie. Look, I could protest a million passages that show you shouldn't go see any secular movie. I mean, if you want to play that game, well, you know, go, go, go see R-rated movies. And then he came up with a problem, though. In 2003, he came up with a huge, huge problem. A movie released that was called The Passion of the Christ. And that passion, that movie was rated? Oh, and you know what he said? I know I've told you never to go see an R-rated movie, but now I'm telling you go see this R-rated movie. I'm thinking, man, just give me your number, and I will call you about every movie. I don't, you can be the clearinghouse. I'll just dial it up. Hey, I'm thinking about going to see, uh, uh, going to see Mulan. Oh, no, don't go, go see Mulan. Okay, all right. I, you can't. Why, why would we do that? Why would I... Take that next step to shackle another fellow believer when what God wants me to do is to release them and to free them in the liberty that he has given us. These last two we're going to go over real quickly because I went over that one a little longer than I wanted to. But we'll wrap these up here, uh, here in, uh, in, a, in the next few minutes. Um, number, so number one, the number one reason why grace is controversial is because it requires us to free people when our nature is to do the exact opposite. The second reason why grace is controversial, because we believe simply that rules are easier. They're just easier. So Paul wrote Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through, I don't know, what is there, the total number of verses in that, 11 or 12, whatever the case may be. In answer to a question, the Corinthian believers had reached out to him about this question about idle meat. Do you realize that could have been the shortest chapter in the entire Bible? All Paul had to do was say what? Or no. No. <laughs> That's it. Romans 8, 1, 1. Shortest chapter in the Bible. No. It would have been really easy just to say, no, don't eat that meat sacrifice. But he didn't do that. What did he do? He used it as an opportunity to explain grace to us. And anytime we see more of grace, that is a very, very good thing. Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 8 is one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, and it didn't even have to exist if all Paul was worried about was just saying, look, I don't care about all this stuff. Let's just say no and be done with it. But he knew that wasn't what God wanted. And we see this again in an extraordinary interaction between Peter and Jesus in Acts chapter 10. So in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 15, let me read this to you. I want you to listen very carefully. You guys have been here for a while. You've heard me mention this passage often because it is extremely important for us to be able to understand this. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted to eat something. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. So you see the point, he was praying, he's seeing this vision of this big giant white sheet. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice said to him, came to him again a second time and said, what God has made clean. Do not call common. And we'll finish it with 16. This happened three times and the thing was taken up once into heaven. Now, one of the things we have to make sure we understand here, Paul was a Jewish person who followed the dietary food laws that were, uh, that were outlined in the law. But in Mark chapter 7, verses 18 through 19, Jesus made all animals clean. Peter was there. He heard him say this. Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles them, but it's what put into a person that defiles them, but what comes out of a person that defiles them. And it says in that passage, by saying this, Jesus made all animals clean. So there were no such thing as clean or unclean animals. Now, here's the interesting thing. First of all, Peter knew that because he was there with Jesus when he said it. Second of all, he recognized the voice as being Jesus because he calls him Lord. So Jesus is telling Peter to do something. I want you to think about this for a second. 
This is the danger in all of this. But everybody thinks about legalism as just this kind of harmless quirk that some believers have. No, it's heresy that will lead people further away from God. The sooner we understand that, the better off we're going to be. So here's Peter who hears Jesus' voice. And Jesus actually tells what I wouldn't long to actually hear, the audible voice of Jesus. I would love to hear that. This, I mean, I know it will eventually, but I'd love to hear it now. To hear that. And he says, he points to those animals and he says, get up, Peter. I want you to kill one of those animals and I want you, I'll kill those animals and I want you to eat them. And what does Peter say to Jesus? No. No. And what reason did he give for saying no to Jesus? Because it's against the rules. Isn't that extraordinary? You see how dangerous this can be when we place rules that are not biblically based on people, no matter how well-intentioned they might be. And I've heard all kinds. Of, look, when I was in the good old days, when I was a kid, well, I was a kid. I was saved when I was 20. I mean, I was still a kid. You know, the older I get, the older somebody has to be can still be a kid. Right? I, I guess when I'm 80, I meet a 60-year-old. What you doing here, kid? You know, I, I think it's... So I was a kid. I was 20 years old. And I'm sitting out in the congregation, and I remember hearing pastors say, if, if you're really and truly a Christian, you'll dress the right way when you come to church. It's only one day a week, and this is a very important time. You should be wearing a jacket, and you should be wearing a tie. Well, that one didn't stick, right? I mean, I, I don't know where that guy is now and, and how that works out. Um, I mean, people tell you that, I mean, well, back in the old days, man, a lot of you guys remember the old days. Back in the old days, it was... Uh, Sunday school, Sunday morning worship service, church training, the Sunday evening service, Monday night visitation, and a Wednesday night service. And you were expected, by the way, to be at all of them. You better be in your place. You're not really a believer. If you're not, look, every time the door's open, you were supposed to be here. That's not scriptural in any way, shape, or form. I remember one, one dear, sweet lady year, years and years ago when she was heard that some some churches were going to have having services on saturday night and she said oh oh no we can't do that and the pastor asked why why can't we have a worship service on saturday night she said because we need to do what the scripture says and he said oh cool what does the scripture say we need to go to church on sunday morning sunday night and wednesday night <laughs> isn't that interesting <laughs> the, the early church didn't even meet on sunday not for a while they met on saturday so it, but that's not in there. But she had convinced herself that that rule was actually in there. You know why? Because it's easier than grace. It's simpler, or so we think. But what happens when we start going with the rules instead of actually applying grace to them? It's the reason, guys, I hope you understand this, that when we talk about the law and grace, the law in the Old Testament and the grace in the New Testament, I don't want you to ever get the idea that the law was bad. It wasn't. God created it, and he can't create anything bad. It was good. We just misunderstand, a lot of times, misunderstand the reason it was given in the first place. The reason the law was given in the first place was so that we would know we would never be able to keep it, and we would need grace. So even the law was pointing to grace. So in other words, God's own law was unkeepable in order to have righteousness being bestowed upon us, but we think our rules... We can keep those and have righteousness bestowed upon us. It's insanity, isn't it? It's crazy that we will do this. Because we think it's easier, but it's not easier. And I think it's Isaiah where, where, uh, where God says, you honor me with your mouth, but your hearts are far from me. That's the essence of, of extra biblical rules. Because if we go by rules, if you go by laws, there are two very important aspects of laws that we have to understand. It will never happen. It will never change. It will, it will always be the case. When you have laws, you are going to have at least two very important things. One is lawyers. And the lawyers end up becoming more important than the word themselves. So then you end up going to a person who will tell you, you can't do this and you can do this. Right? Scripture says in the Old Testament, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then does what? Doesn't explain what that means. <laughs> So we have to come up with a bunch of rules that explain what that means. Okay, well, what cons what's, what's considered work? Well, who do we see about that? We see a person now. We no longer seek out God's word. We go to that person. So the lawyer then is the one who tells us you need to do this and you need to do that. And the second thing that always goes with the first one, because they go hand in hand, if you're going to have laws, you will have loopholes. You will find a way around that law if you really and truly want to. That is our nature. So you can technically keep the law, 
while spiritually disobeying, which is what he meant when he said, you honor me with your mouth. You're saying these things, and you may be actually doing some of them to a certain extent, but your hearts are far from me. You're not engaged with me in any way, shape, or form. One of the biggest examples that I've seen in, in, in recent time, this is actually a real one, um, that happened to us when we were in Texas, uh, when Kimberly was working at a, at a local bank, um, she had obviously we, some, some folks there actually we went, went to church with, we got to know, got to be friends with, and he had, she had one guy in particular who was a Messianic Jew. I think I may have shared this story with you before. He was a Messianic Jew, so he was Jewish, but he was a Jewish person who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So in essence, he was a Christian, even though they don't prefer that term, they prefer Messianic Jew. So he was a Messianic Jew. Now, what's interesting about Messianic Jews is they often continue to hold on to some of the Old Testament ways of doing things, and they intersperse it with, which is fine. I've got, if that is their conscience, that's what God is calling them to do, okay, that's not, i got no problem with that. Well, here's the thing. Every now and then, he would have to be called in to work on his Sabbath, which was obviously Saturday. He, they still viewed the Sabbath as sundown from Friday to sundown to Saturday. Every now and then, he would have to be called in to work on Sabbath. Now, he made that one right. Not sure exactly how he worked that out. I guess, you know, getting paid was important to him. So he would work on the Sabbath, but it was interesting. There was one particular time where Kimberly was telling me this story where he came in and it was time, it was lunchtime. Well, he didn't bring his lunch. So they had somebody in most offices, right? Somebody's going to go out and make a, make a run, right? Going to go with them or whatever the case may be, go out and eat or whatever the case may be. But anyway, but he's got a problem because in Jewish law, one of the things you can't do on the Sabbath is exchange money. Right? I actually worked with an Orthodox Jew when I was in the Navy. He couldn't turn on a light switch on the Sabbath. He would not turn on one light in his house because that was making fire. And the, and the, scripture, well, the scripture didn't say that. The Talmud said that, which is an explanation of, of that. So he was, in a, he was in a bit of a quandary. How in the world is he going to eat without exchanging money? And this is how he figured it out. He gave the money to somebody else, asked them to buy his lunch, and told them to keep the change. Isn't that interesting? And he was completely fine with that. Did he personally, technically, exchange money on the Sabbath? He did not. He had somebody else violate the Sabbath for him. But he didn't do it. He thought by getting the change back, that, oh, that's exchanging money, right? So he just keep the change. So in his mind, he literally thought he was keeping that rule. Was he keeping that rule? He absolutely was not keeping it. If you believed, that's what God is trying to tell you today. If you come to that conclusion, which is fine if that's what you want to do, don't think you can give the money to somebody else. You are, getting, you are doing exactly the opposite of what the law is telling you to do while making you think you're doing it in the first place. That's the problem with thinking that rules are simpler and easier. Don't do this. Don't celebrate Halloween. Don't drink. Don't do whatever. Uh, yeah. And where I'm from, back in, the, back in uh, South Carolina, it, you know, you don't drink, dance, smoke, or chew, or date women who do. Right? There's a whole laundry list of things you're just not supposed to do. And we think that's just easier, but it's not. We will find ways around it. So we will actually find ways to violate God's word by claiming we're doing it at the exact same time. God knew we were going to do that, which is why he doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to live under grace. And we'll finish up quickly with this last one here, and then we will be finished up. And I hope you're seeing that a lot of these are all kind of connected together. One of the reasons that grace is as controversial as it is, and I mentioned this earlier, is because the closer, a lot of people believe the closer we get to grace, the more likely we are to sin, and therefore grace is scary. It's scary to some people. It's just easier for me to tell you, no, don't do that. It's easier for me to tell you, no, don't go see R-rated movies. Look, let me ask you something. Are there some R-rated movies that believers probably shouldn't see? Yes, there's a lot of them that I don't see. There are things that I draw the line on that I will not watch, I will not engage in. And as long as those lines are not crystal clear in Scripture, that's one thing. How many of you ever, also, ever saw the movie Schindler's List? You ever see that movie? It's a very difficult movie to watch if you haven't seen it. I, I, I fall short of recommending it because it's not one of the things you'll grab your popcorn and, and sit there and watch a movie about the Holocaust. I mean, it's a very realistic movie, and they have a realistic depiction of what happened to the Jews when they were placed in the camps. And one of the things that the, the Nazis used to do in order to disarm them, completely disarm them, make them feel completely vulnerable and make them completely malleable, is to strip them completely nude. 
And that was a way to keep them from fighting back. They knew that they were outnumbered. They weren't outgunned, but they were outnumbered. So they had to figure out a way to keep people malleable, and that was the way they do it. So in the movie, you see that. Listen, is that the same as an R-rated movie about a stripper? No, it's not the same. I'm not saying you should watch either one of those two, by the way. But I am saying there is a difference between that. And some people would look at that and say, no, it has nudity, uh, 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 human nudity in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to watch it. Great. But then don't turn around and say, neither does it can anybody else. And you're not a real believer if you don't do X. You're not a real believer if you don't say X, if you don't act in this way. Because they're afraid. And I don't understand the fear. The more I understand grace, the more I see my sin for what it truly is, and the more I don't want to do it. If I can find a loophole, even as a believer, if I can find a loophole around my sin, guess what? I will take it. That is just who we are. That's why grace has to be more important than the rules. That's why it can't be scary in any way, shape, or form. I've told somebody before the service, I have known people who have lost jobs in ministry because they emphasize grace. You think my friend in the car was a little worried about that? You think he might have been just a little worried if he went to his deacon bar and started talking about how we're not going to do this anymore and we're not going to do that? Look, it's scary when your sacred cows are slaughtered right in front of you. It is. I've had them. This happened to me. I grew up in churches where you don't do this and you do this and you don't do this, and I found out that 80% of them have nothing to do with Scripture. But I believe they did. And so when the reality came in that those things were not What God intended, and it's not what he said in any way, shape, or form, it's uncomfortable. I didn't like it. But I don't have the luxury of telling you what I think God says. I only have the responsibility of telling you what he does say. I want you to experience as much grace as is humanly possible, because if you do, you will sin less. You will experience the life that God wants us to have because of his grace. He didn't just save us by grace. He wants us to live in that grace. And every single rule or law or whatever it is you want to call it that we put into place that is not rooted in Scripture in any way, shape, or form is basically saying, Lord, your word is not right. My word is better than yours. You left this out. Let me fix this for you. You didn't mention this. Let me fix this to you. The easiest thing Paul could have done to the Corinthians was just tell them, no, don't eat it. That way we don't have to talk about it anymore. But because he didn't do that, we now have an understanding of grace that we would not have had if he had just said no. There are things we are not supposed to do. There are quite a few things we are not supposed to do. Clearly not supposed to do. There are other things that we are supposed to do. Clearly are. There are thou shalt and thou shalt not in Scripture. There are. But there are a whole lot of things that don't fall into that category. So what are we going to do about that? Are we going to try to listen to somebody else's rule that doesn't have can't be? Can't? Look, when I was when I was a kid, and, and again a kid, when I was sitting in, in church and and we would have the altar call, I had a pastor up there, and I'm not besmirching him. I love him dearly. But I had a guy who would stand up there, and as he was trying to encourage, some would say, maybe a little too much encourage these numbers of people coming down front, he would say the same thing every week. He would say, everybody that God called, in the, uh, Jesus called in the Scripture, he called publicly. And so I would go out, when I would talk to people about the gospel, I would say, oh, well, if you get saved, you've got to go down front. Why? Because everybody that Jesus called, he called publicly. Then I actually started reading the Bible and I found out that wasn't the case. He didn't call everybody public. Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple. Nicodemus came to talk to Jesus at night. He didn't call everybody publicly, but that's what I had been saying. I believed that. I believed it was scriptural. And I was putting that burden on people who, might would, have, who, who, would, who would consider this whole faith thing and, and then think, oh, God, if I've got to go down, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to, I don't want to do all that. I say that to my shame, to be honest with you. And it was uncomfortable when I realized that wasn't the truth. I didn't want it to not be the truth. I liked it. That's a great ring to it, doesn't it? Anybody the Lord called, they called publicly. Everybody needed to come down publicly. Oh, of course, that's not true. But you, you see the point? God saved us with his grace. Now he wants us to live in that grace, not shackled, not chained by anybody else or ourselves, but to only live 
and the grace that he has given us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy and your salvation. Lord, I, I am overwhelmed at what you have done for me and what you continue to do for me. I am overwhelmed at what I see you do in the lives of others. Lord, I know that if, as believers, when we come to faith in you, we have no problem, no problem acknowledging the fact that we have come to you only by your grace. But then as soon as that event is over, that, that deal has been sealed, for lack of a better word, we have a tendency then just, the Lord, to shift into a bunch of rules that some may be related to your word, but so many are not. You freed us to be able to live in the grace that you saved us with. And that grace gives us the ability, the more I understand your grace, the more I see it, the more it is embedded in my life, the more blatant my sin becomes, the clearer my choices become. I then have the ability to choose the things that edify me, to choose the things that don't humiliate non-believers or even other believers who've seen things differently than I do, the ability to love and guide and bring those people along in the same way that you have sent people in my life to bring me along. Well, as believers in this room here this morning, for those of us who are saved, for those of us who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, may we always seek to unbind our fellow brother and sister and not rebind them with things that you have not intended for them in any way, shape, or form. And we only do that by knowing your word, what it really says, not what we want it to say, not what we hope it says, not what we think it says, but what it actually says says, may we be a people who unbinds our fellow believers. And for those of you who might be here today who are not saved, who have not received Christ your Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day that those wraps will begin the process of being unbound, that you would receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive the grace not only that he will save you with, but that he will give you to live with from that time forward until we hear on that final day, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for everything you have done for me, everything you are doing for me now, and everything I know that you will do for me. And I thank you for your grace. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.